Good morning again. Today we start a new sermon series entitled Women in the Bible. It's kind of a follow-on to last week's uh, transition week, if you will, uh, when we moved from our summer with Paul, looking at the story of Priscilla and her husband Aquila, uh, whom Alex called uh, a biblical power couple, and how they were a vital part of Paul's ministry. Uh, for today and the next five Sundays... Um, we will be taking a look at the stories of women in Scripture. Some are well-known stories, some lesser-known stories. Today, we turn to two women, Shifra and Pua, whose stories told in Exodus 1. They're two Hebrew midwives that show us how to put God first in our lives. So let's start with the principle that actions speak louder than words. It's cliche in many ways, but it's so true. And that's one of the reasons it's valuable to study Scripture stories about people living out their faith. We can see how they put words into action, how they put their faith, their beliefs, into living out God's Word in daily lives. Our actions today speak louder than words too. One thing that comes to mind in a negative way is that frequently we profess to love someone, yet then we do something that they don't perceive as loving and question how we care about them. Actions speak louder than words. I thought this week when I read of an elementary school in Gwinnett County, in the yearbook, students were told to make a silly face. And several of the students squinted their eyes and pulled the sides of their eyes out in a racially offensive manner that stereotypes Asian Americans frequently. They may not have intended what they did to hurt someone, but their actions spoke louder than their words, and it was a teaching moment for the adults in that situation to take corrective action. Some today say that we oppose racism or we want to write injustices based on race yet do nothing to learn about the injustices, do nothing to reach out and find about how persons adversely impacted by prejudice according to race or ethnicity or religion actually feel, and we do nothing to combat injustices to fight injustice in our own families, in our circle of influence, much less in our national institutions. We often say that we want our churches and our community to come together and to unite, yet we post things on social media that divide us, trying to draw groups of us and them Actions speak louder than words, and just as bad as actively posting, we stand passively by and say nothing when a friend or a neighbor or a family member posts offensive things. We profess to put God first, but in reality we leave God in the church building on Sunday or now leave God in our virtual worship building 
on Sunday and act as what I've heard called practical atheists the rest of the week. We get too busy to spend time with God in prayer and Bible study. We value our personal comfort and what others think of us more than speaking out when those around us say or do things that demean or harm others. Sometimes we even put good things like family or recreational activities before taking time to serve others as God might want us to have. So let's turn to our Bible study or Bible story today. And I'll start with the thought of what's in a name or two. Specifically, what's in, first of all, the name Shifra and Pua, as is the case with most names, especially Hebrew names, they have inherent meanings, but in this case, the meaning of the name really has nothing to do with the story. Shifra and Pua are two midwives, two Israelite midwives who take care of the Israelite women giving birth while they were in Egypt. We don't really know that how old they are. We assume from both the practical need to give care for many births in the Israelite race, as well as some hints in the text in Exodus 1 that Melissa read earlier. We believe these are probably the senior midwives. They're probably not the only two midwives that were working in Israel, but their story is one of heroic resistance. So much so that the author of Hebrews, excuse me, the author of Exodus, wanted us to know their names. Indeed, in the first five chapters of Exodus, we have the beginning of chapter 1 listing Jacob's family. And then we have, after Shifra and Pua are mentioned, the only other people mentioned in the first five chapters of Exodus are Moses and Moses' family, as well as the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of the Israelite nation. The name of their opponent, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, appears nowhere. The leaders in Israel at the time, the elders who are mentioned during the story of Moses early on in his life, are unnamed. The writer of Exodus wants us to know who these women are and for us to remember them. We want them to be remembered and commemorated as heroes who did a courageous act in standing up to the power and the authority of their day and also as examples to be followed. But it's not just Shifra and Pua's name that matters in this text. The other interesting thing that the writer of Hebrews and I keep saying that. Let's, let's uh, talk about the writer of Exodus. And the reason I keep going back to Hebrews is because that's the other name that matters. What's in the name Hebrews? In this text, starting in chapter, or excuse me, verse 16, going through the rest of the chapter, the writer, even when quoting Pharaoh uses the word Hebrews to describe God's people as opposed to Israelites that's normally used. Some writers or some commentators believe that Hebrews maybe is a reference to the Haparu, a stateless underclass in the ancient Near East. 
who were slaves in many cases. That may or may not be what Hebrews comes from. More than likely, Hebrews is simply the outsider's name for the Israelites, particularly when they want to construct them as the other, as the downtrodden. We see that in other passages throughout Scripture, particularly in the book of 2 Samuel. But either way, the shift from Israelite to Hebrews indicates that they're downtrodden. That this is a seamless, seemingly powerless group of people who are enslaved, yet God hears their cries and even before he brings their Savior in the form of Moses, brings these two women, Shifra and Puah, to resist the powers that are in existence. This ties right in with our scripture lesson from Psalms 138 that Delinda read earlier where the psalmist says that God regards the lowly. Now, in the full context of Psalm 138, he's probably talking about God regarding those who are humble, those who are not haughty or arrogant, more so than talking about social class. But it still is a good reminder that God looks out for us when we are down. God looks out for us when either because of external forces we feel put down and oppressed or because of our own recognition of our humanness, our humanity, our shortcomings. We are most accepting of God's presence in our life. So God saw God's people in Egypt being oppressed by Pharaoh and by the Egyptians. God heard them and God brought salvation. The other lesson that we learn from Shifra and Pua's story is the importance of fearing God. We are to fear God. Shifra and Puah were told by Pharaoh, when you go to attend birth of an Israelite or a Hebrew woman, when you see that a boy is born, kill him. If you see that it's a girl, let them live. But the writer tells us that Shifra and Puah feared God more than they were concerned about Pharaoh, and so they disobeyed. They didn't do it, even though that certainly put their lives at great risk, and perhaps the lives of other midwives who they supervised or were for. But they resisted Pharaoh's order because they answered to a higher authority, God. They feared God. Why should... They fear God. Why should we fear God? We see part of the answer in our psalm lesson today where the psalmist talks about God's chesed. Some of you may remember my uh, sermon on chesed where we use the Hebrew word rather than the English translations, but this word is most often translated as steadfast love or love. Sometimes grace is a good translation for chesed. But the psalmist today says that God is faithful in God's love. God is to be praised for God's steadfast love with our whole heart. And indeed, the psalm closes with the psalmist saying, 
The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. The Israelite women, the Hebrew midwives, knew that God's love would carry them through. God's love would protect them. And so they feared God. They didn't fear God in the sense of being afraid of God or scared of God. They loved God. They respected God. They believed in God and God's promises. And as a result, they wanted to obey God and do God's will. And murdering defenseless baby boys isn't God's will. And they knew it. And even at the risk of their own lives in resisting Pharaoh's order, they chose to save the Hebrew babies, to include ultimately Moses, the one who God chose to lead God's people out of slavery in Egypt. Notice also scripture tells us that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God, the belief and the respect and the awe of God's presence and God's word and God's knowledge and God's direction. And so that fear, that respect, that awe led them to the wisdom of God's will, knowing how to resist Pharaoh's order. There's a problem, though, when we talk about Shifra and Pua fearing God, believing God, and putting God's word into practice, because notice what the story says happens a little while after Pharaoh gave his order to kill the baby boys. It's probably a year or so later, Pharaoh has noticed there seems to be no difference in the toddlers running around boys and girls than Pharaoh would have expected. So Pharaoh calls Shifra and Pua back in and says, Why didn't you obey me? Why didn't you do what I said and kill the boys? And Shifra and Pua respond saying that Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. That word that's translated vigorous really uh, means literally lively or alive with vigor, the vigor of life. Most English translations seem to take the view that there was something physiologically different between the Hebrew mothers and the Egyptian mothers. I'm not sure that that's right. There's a much better, I think, understanding of this passage and the word that's translated vigor or vigorous in that there's probably a sociological difference. And this is important in answering the question, did Shifra and Pua lie to Pharaoh? Did they come up with this story that the Hebrew women are different to protect their own interests? Or were they in fact telling the truth? It's entirely possible that this vigor, this liveliness means that Hebrew women are more actively involved in their own birth, their own giving of birth, whereas in contrast, Egyptian women just basically lay back, close their eyes, and let the midwives handle everything. Lest you think that this is just some overactive imagination on the part of Sai, it fits with Pharaoh's expectation that they would have a chance to kill the boy babies without the mother knowing it. If the mother just sit back and do nothing. But perhaps it's a family and societal practice that Hebrew women were more actively involved and aware of their birth 
as it went. It also leaves open the very likely possibility that there was a national conspiracy against Pharaoh. I can just imagine Shifram Pua and the other Hebrew midwives saying to the prospective mothers, do everything possible to give birth before we're called to your home. We'll be there to take care of everything, but don't call us until the baby's actually born. The Hebrew women are more actively involved in their birth. But even if that's not what happened, even if the midwives led by Shifra and Pua refused to do what Pharaoh said, even being present at the actual birth, and Shifra and Pua lied to, he, to Pharaoh, we must remember that God's word, God's orders, God's direction are to serve God's creation, not the other way around. Creation isn't simply to come up with or obey some rule merely out of rote. Sometimes it may be necessary to lie to save a life. In this case, the Shifra and Pua lying to Pharaoh to save the lives of the baby boys and perhaps the lives of other midwives. Think of the righteous Gentiles during the Holocaust that perhaps were asked if they knew where Jews were in Germany or in other places the Nazis were seeking to kill Jews and they lied to save them. Or think of members of the Underground Railroad in our nation during the abolition movement. Certainly those lies or less than truths were not sinful. I think even today of an incident in my former church where an elderly woman with dementia came to visit one Sunday. Her name was Rue. And everyone was cautioned not to say anything about the passing of Rue's husband several months earlier. To just play along if Rue asked anything about her husband. Because, you see, the family said that every time Rue learned of her husband's death, she went through all the mourning all over again because of her dementia. Certainly that is a case of being less than fully truthful to serve the life of someone else. So what are gods that seek our attention today? The psalmist at the beginning of Psalm 138 says, I will give praise to you before the gods, before the foreign gods reading between the, light, the, the lines here. Perhaps it's our selfish rights, our belief that we have rights and are resistant to giving them up at all. We don't want to wear masks. We don't wish to be scrupulous about observing social distancing. We don't want to avoid crowds if we want to gather with other people, no matter what impacts that it may have on others. We insist on having people discuss racism or protest racism on our terms rather than listening to and allowing those who actually suffer from racism and oppression decide how they wish to be heard, how they wish to protest. Maybe our other gods is money, our bank account, our retirement account. We're relying on our financial resources rather than on God. What does the way we live each day say about us, say about you and me? Because we need to realize and remember that everything we say and everything that we do big and small, 
speaks volumes about who we are and who we follow. Do we celebrate life and joy in community? Or do others see us as dwelling on darkness, on death, on negativism and division and selfishness? Ultimately, our true audience isn't other people, but it's God. Worship isn't limited to Sunday morning. Worship is how we live our daily lives, how Shifra and Puah lived out their faith, their fear of God, their belief in God in their professional lives as midwives. We are to put God first in all that we do, not just what we say. In closing, I mention that it's not about me at all. We've often heard it said, and I've said on many occasions when I think I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, thinking a little bit too much about myself, I say, it's not all about me. But honestly, the more I seek to be in tune with God, I realize it's not about me at all. It's all about God. Shifra and Puah not only put the interest of others first, specifically the mothers and the families and the baby boys first, they acted contrary to their apparent self-interest. They put their lives at risk to serve others. How can we put feet to our words and practice what we preach about wanting to put God first in all that we do? And the best example that I can come up with is what's known as the Prayer of St. Francis, frequently attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, but we have no record of it before the early 20th century, so it probably doesn't date to him, but it's certainly consistent with Franciscan thought. And it goes like this. Lord, make me a channel of thy peace where there is hatred. Let me bring love. Where there is wrong, let me bring forgiveness. Where there's discord, let me bring harmony. That where there is error, I may bring truth. Where there is doubt, I may bring faith. Where there's despair, I may bring hope. Where there are shadows, I may bring light. Where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord, grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is by self-forgetting that one finds, it is by forgiving that one is forgiven, it is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Pray with me. Father, help us to live out our faith in you. Help us to be examples of your love to those around us. We often fall short and we confess that. But we claim your steadfast love and patience and grace and forgiveness. Thanking you for it. Thanking you for the gift of your son Jesus Christ and the example of heroic women like Shifra and Pua. All these things prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may God bless you with a restless discomfort about easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may seek truth boldly and love deep within your heart. May God bless you with holy anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work tirelessly for justice, freedom, and peace among all people. May God bless you with the gift of tears to shed with those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, or the loss of things and loved ones they cherish.
so that you may reach out their hand, your hand to them, to comfort and transform their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you really can make a difference in this world so that you are able with God's grace and in the power of God's Holy Spirit to do what others claim can't be done. Live God's love into our country.